everyone. Thank you for joining uh, one of our very first Facebook Lives and our official first Facebook Live with our wonderful partners here at the National Museum of Psychology at the University of Akron. Um, I'm Courtney Flickinger. I'm the Communications Specialist at Direction Home Akron Canyon Area Agency on Aging and Disabilities. If you're not familiar with our agency, we are the Area Agency on Aging for Portage, Stark, Summit, and Wayne Counties. Um, and we provide different choices to keep people at home for as long as possible. Uh, we've got a resource center, it's free to call, and you can call for loved ones, you can refer them, you can refer neighbors, you can call just to get some more information about aging supports in your area. We've got uh, health and wellness education, and uh, Medicare education, family caregiver support, and a whole bunch of other programs, including some that Lori runs, so I'll let her introduce herself. Good morning, I am Lori Smith. I oversee all things education with Direction Home. That includes our professional trainings that we do to keep our licensed people um, current with their certifications, as well as, Courtney mentioned, our health and wellness classes. We have a few that are um, focused on reducing your risk of falls, and then we've got one for just those family caregivers. Um, we give them resources to be able to, one, take care of themselves, and then be the best caregiver they can be. Uh, but those health and wellness workshops we offer throughout our four county service region of, again, Stark Summit Portage and Wayne Counties. They are free for community members to attend, so if you have any questions on that, um, Courtney mentioned our Aging and Disability Resource Center, they can connect you with me. So um, why we are here is to work with the center for um, our project is Aging as an Art Form, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the end, but I wanted to put that bug in your ear. It's a lovely project that ties in what home feels like to you, and we'll do a journaling project at the end of this session. So, And that's actually a beautiful tie-in, because our exhibit here um, at the National Museum of Psychology is called Beyond the Picket Fence, the places and spaces we call home. Um, and the idea with the exhibit is to explore this idea of home, how that word and that experience can mean something different to each one of us, um, and it can also change over our life. And so we created an exhibit with community partners, with collections here at the National Museum of Psychology, um, and looking at how psychologists have studied this topic, but also just how uh, some different examples about how the topic might be explored. Uh, my name I should have started with is Jennifer Bazaar. I'm the assistant director here um, at what's called the Cumming Center for the History of Psychology, where the National Museum of Psychology resides. Um, and maybe we'll just jump right into it. Um, uh, we have a couple of examples that we want to share with you today from the exhibit. Um, if you have questions or comments, you can actually type those directly into the comment box on Facebook. Um, and we will make sure to be responding to those at the end of our little mini tour today. Uh, but the example that I wanted to start with, actually, because we've mentioned sort of aging as an art form, is actually an ex example about aging. Um, so one of the uh, topics that we looked around uh, with home was about uh, care homes um, and some of their history. And there was this really interesting study back in the mid-1970s with psychologists Ellen Langer and Judith Rodin. And what they did was they went to a senior's home. And they worked sort of in two different ways on two different floors. On floor number one, uh, they gave all of the residents a plant. And they said, you are caring for this plant. It's yours. You know, you take care of it. You have responsibility over it. Uh, you know, do as you will with the plant. On the second floor, they again gave all of the residents a plant. Uh, but instead, what they said was, don't worry. You don't have any problems to, to concern yourselves with. The staff will take care of the plant for you just like they take care of you. And so there was sort of almost this removal of agency from the residents who were living on that particular floor. And what they found at the end of the study was that those on the first floor who had been told that they could take care of the plant, that they had agency over this and no agency of their own care, saw not only an improvement in terms of the amount of activity that they were engaged in, but also their reports of satisfaction and contentment with their experience. Whereas those on the floor where they were told that they would be taken care of, the plant would be taken care of, and really kind of that agency removed from their experiences, really had um, lower levels of activity and actually saw a decline in their health. And so it's, it's a relatively simple study, but it's a great example of sort of, um, even when we're not necessarily living in our own spaces, maybe we need some extra supports and that kind of thing, that really it's sort of those engagements and feeling like you have some control of your life do make a lot of difference. Like they are participating and actively engaged in life. Yeah, absolutely. 
we can give you a bit of another example about this. We're going to move a little bit to the left here. So a lot of the times when uh, we ask people what they think about as home, right? It's sort of what's, what's that immediate reaction people get. It tends to be around a physical place. And sometimes that sort of falls into an aesthetic, right? How do we design our physical homes? Um, how do we choose those spaces? You know, is it, is it choosing it based on an aesthetic or a location? What do we bring into those spaces? Um, and a lot of people, you know, psychologists as well as other fields have looked at this idea. Um, so one of the examples we have in the exhibit is the Minnesota House Design and House Furnishing Test. This is from the late 1930s, and it was actually a test that was used in a uh, home economics class in Minnesota with uh, young women. Uh, who were being trained about how to care for their home. What was their role going to be? How were they going to create a safe and loving space for their families? And it was quite particular. Um, and I'll give you an example. It wasn't sort of just, you know, make sure the space is nice and clean. It was also, um, they were being trained in a particular aesthetic. So some of the examples uh, come from the original test here. Uh, so the question is, which living room gives the appearance of being livable and inviting? And we've got sort of two different living rooms. Both of them have fireplaces. The one on the left here sort of has some bookcases built in, a nice couch, a writing desk. The one on the right has two chairs on either side of the fireplace with a carpet and then a sort of a bookcase corner with some plants. What do you think? Which one gives the appearance of being livable and inviting? I am more drawn, I think, to this one over here. Okay, well, we can check on our answer. It is, you would have done well on the test. <laughs> In 1939, it was considered to, uh, that the objects, the furnishings, were chosen with discrimination and were in scale with the room, um, and that the way that the furniture and the books were actually placed made it look as though the books were actually used in the home. Whereas on the other side, I think they actually used the word that it's pretentious in some way, yeah. uh, which is kind of interesting because, it, I don't know, I don't quite get that impression. They call it too elaborate, perhaps, you know, with, the, uh, with that big couch in the room. I thought it would look very lovely. <laughs> Um, so, but you know, physical space, not the only way we think about home, right? Sometimes it's a non-physical space. Um, so we'll give you another example of that as well. We're going to go this direction here. So another topic that we explored, uh, or that we explore in the exhibit, is really around this idea um, of you know, space and place, and that it, you know, home doesn't need to be connected to those physical things. Um, and so we looked a lot within our collection at some of the stereotypes of people who are living on house. Um, what are some of the assumptions that are made about the community? Um, you know, what are some of the assumptions that are made about what that experience might be? Even the word, you know, homeless, right? The idea that home somehow is not a part of a person's experience if they don't have a physical home or a permanent address or all these kinds of things. Um, so in addition to um, actually looking within our collection at some of these stereotypes, uh, what we did, you see playing behind us on the screen, um, is we went and we talked to some of our, our neighbors in Akron um, and asked them about, you know, what does home mean to you? Uh, are there things that you associate with home? And we saw a lot of repeats of, of um, uh, you know, what we were seeing even in the sort of the, the other categories or the aesthetics of home design. Really that home is a comfort, uh, that it's a place where you feel safe, that it's a feeling and emotion. Uh, Patty, who's on the screen right now, talks about her dog barking, that when she hears her dog, she knows she's home. Um, or I've got another quote from Kenny behind me, home means a place where you feel safe. Home is where your heart is, right? So it has sort of that flexibility, but really I think a lot of uh, sort of the experiences we could all relate to, and, you know, in many ways. Very much so. So I see this box here, it's got some socks, a bus pass, a can, can with what is this? Can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, so we actually we did the interviews on uh, local activist Sage Lewis's property in Akron um, and spoke with people who were living there on house um, and asked him about, you know, he works a lot with the community and about what do people typically have with them? Um, you know, if they are moving from place to place or if they're, you know, they have a tent or these kinds of things, what are some of the items that are really common? Um, and he said, you know, blanket, absolutely, things like warm socks. Uh, you know, kind of left, you know, a broken cell phone, uh, but you know, things that ways of seeing communication still, right? Uh, a metro pass, ways to get around. And so we, what we tried to do was kind of 
uh, bring some of those examples physically into the space as well uh, to help capture that experience. I think that's a really good example of home as a concept instead of an actual physical place. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I think we can all relate to that a lot yeah. too, right? Yeah. I don't know. Somebody who's moved around a lot, sometimes it really is more about those emotions or the, like, the connections with people. Right, and like you see with Patty, when her dog barks, yeah. that's when she knows she's home. And so many people, I think, associate their pets um, as being such an important part of home. Absolutely. Well, to take a little bit of a different spin on this, um, one of the other topics we looked at was what happens when home is actually taken from us? You know, what happens when we lose home? Um, so I want to give you that example as well. We're going to do one more spin here. Uh, 
uh, who's watching, um, is back to direction home. Uh, so one of the things we did uh, was we wanted to make sure to partner with local organizations who are already, you know, right now in this moment, exploring ideas of home and uh, what that means to different people and how they can be supported. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what we've got beside you? Yeah, so we were really excited uh, when we were approached about this partnership for a bunch of different reasons. As you can see here, we ended up contributing a few different sections within this part of the exhibit. Um, so. I, my first thought when I heard about the exhibit and its theme and everything were two members that I had interviewed, um, two members of Direction Home that received different services from us. The first being Tracy. So Tracy was kind enough to lend a homemade candle and a homemade necklace to this exhibit. Um, I thought of her immediately from my conversation with her about the jewelry that she creates and just how passionate she was about staying in her home. So Tracy had suffered from falls and strokes and all sorts of medical uh, issues. She received services from us to help her stay at home, so she needs help with doing laundry and cooking and cleaning. Um, and just, she has general mobility issues. She needs help getting in and out of her apartment, um, getting help to from the store and things like that. But what struck me the most about my conversation with Tracy was how beautiful her decor was in her apartment when I was there. So she had walls of different colored glass uh, objects. They were all color coded, so she, I think in her video she was behind the pink section, but over here off camera she had a green section and a blue section, and it was just, it was really neat to see um, how she had personalized her apartment space. And then the second thing that struck me as I was talking to Tracy was how important it was for her to stay at home and remain living independently. Um, she. I, I think this is almost a direct quote in my interview with her, it said that if she had to move into a facility where they had to tell her when to eat and what she was eating and when she was, you know, allowed in and out of the room or anything like that, that she felt like she would just kind of shrivel up and die. So I thought that was a, a really strong reaction to the thought of moving out of what she considered home. Um, so cooking really important to Tracy, making her jewelry and doing all of those hobbies that keep her active are all part of what she considers home. The second member, who uh, good timing happens to be on this rotating screen here, her name was Anita, um, and I loved visiting Anita's house, it was beautiful, she, you might not be able to see it, but she had her little dog Nikki um, sitting on the couch with her throughout her interview, and she, uh, her husband was actually the one who received our services. And actually recently passed when this interview took place uh, from, from advanced Alzheimer's. But he received different services, uh, like a walk-in shower, they had some minor home modifications, they were able to update their deck um, and make sure it was safe for them to go out. So he was actually able to enjoy that just before his passing and he was able to stay in their home through hospice, which was very important to both of them. Um, and Anita spoke strongly about her neighbors and her community and being able to walk her little dog and, and greet all of her friends and everything. Um, so her concept of home was a little bit different than Tracy's, but still the same thing. So yeah, that individuality, yes. right? We all take these a little bit differently. Exactly. Yeah. And then the final piece um, that we put together here was actually a survey that we opened up to the entire community, um, which hopefully some of the people viewing this actually contributed to because we had over 60 responses in a very short period of time. Um, and all that survey was was a simple question, what does home mean to you? We asked people to identify themselves or stay anonymous, but if they chose to do an identifier, we provided suggestions like maybe your street name growing up or your current hometown or your current town that you're living in or your hometown, um, nicknames that you go by, and we got a whole bunch of fun responses there. Uh, but I think our youngest respondent was seven years old and the oldest was 92. So there was a whole bunch of intergenerational responses within that, uh, but it, we got some really great responses. I'll read a couple of them off here. Uh, so some examples of the ones that we got were, uh, home is where you feel love and comfort, and that's from Akron. Being surrounded by the ones you love, from Diamonds. Uh, home is a warm hug at the end of the day, from Mel. I remember that one from when we first got all the responses in. Um, where I feel comfortable to be myself, and I am surrounded by those that love me from Kendall. So there's some themes I think that carry throughout the whole exhibit in those responses, um, especially from 
the unhoused section where they said home means a place where you feel safe. Safety is a theme that came up a lot in these, as well as comfort, acceptance. People mentioned their pets. Um, they mentioned family members, having specific memories tied to objects within the home. And then one thing I did like was that several people expanded the meaning of home. So um, by people who are not related by blood or for their church or for their community or their city. So that was really interesting to see. I think that tied everything in the exhibit really well together. Um, so we're excited to continue that partnership into an aging as an art form event, which I'll turn it over to Lori to talk a little bit more about. Yeah, thank you. So, yeah, we touched very quickly at the very beginning of this um, with our aging as an art form project and how we're tying it into this Beyond the Picket Fence exhibit. What aging as an art form is, is Direction Home wants to connect older adults with art in all its forms. We know how beneficial art is. It is good for our gross motor skills, our fine motor skills, our cognitive health. People who are experiencing early to mid-stage dementia can really benefit from all things art. So what we are doing with the center and this exhibit is um, you, even watching virtually, if you're watching this live virtually or if you're watching it later on as it's posted, we encourage you to take what you've seen here and think about journaling your experience. And we've got a couple of prompts for you to think about. The first one is, what does home mean to you? So really take that in, think about it, and then jot some of your thoughts down, your feelings and your experiences. And the second is, what does it mean to age at home? We've heard so many things about wanting to stay at home, whether that's the physical structure or the unhoused people who just want that place to feel safe and included, um, and what that means to them, and what it can mean for you to age in what you feel is home. And what we're going to do with these journaling prompts, if you are comfortable in turning them into us, we're going to collect them all and put them together in one large community art piece. And then those will be displayed, we are getting a new office building, so they will be displayed as art from people living, working, and existing in our communities. And it's just a really important thing to see and to share with community members that as we age, we are still very active and vibrant and engaged. We don't just curl up and become irrelevant. We are still very large pieces of our community and we want to keep that going. And then answer any questions with resources that Direction Home can help with, along with the Cummings Center for Psychology, the History of Psychology. And we're going to do this as well on Thursday. Yes. So uh, maybe we should sort of wrap up with an invitation. Um, that if this little teaser of a tour has intrigued you, there are a lot more examples within the Beyond the Picket Fence uh, exhibit, um, all about these different experiences of home. Um, on Thursday, we are going to be going through those examples together in person, on site here at the Cummings Center building. Um, and we are going to finish with that journaling prompt. Uh, so we're actually going to work on those together um, and contribute to uh, the larger project. Um, so definitely, if you haven't registered already, that registration link is on the Direction Home Facebook page and website, um, so it's available to you. I'd also like to extend an invitation to anybody who's watching to come and visit the National Museum of Psychology. Um, if you happen to join us on Thursday for the tour, stay and uh, explore the museum afterwards or come on another day. Uh, the National Museum of Psychology really looks at all sorts of different ways that psychology is around us. It touches on a lot of uh, experiences that are probably familiar to you, uh, from mental health care to testing, education, uh, you know, sort of social change over time, sort of something for everybody, really. Um, so I'd love to have you come down and, uh, and visit. Any last words about home? <laughs>
Are there any questions? Unfortunately okay. not. I do. <laughs> I do have. Are we? Are we still? Okay. I do have a question for you. Yeah. Um, I guess two. So the first being, I, you might have said it and I missed it, but when does the exhibit here, the home Ooh, exhibit, close? Thank you. Appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, Beyond the Picket Fence actually runs all the way into mid-summer of 2024, so there's a lot of time to come and view the exhibit. And we're here uh, Tuesday through Saturday and late on Wednesday evenings. Okay. And then my second question is, uh, maybe if you know, can you speak a little bit about the exhibit curator and you know, who, who they are and how they keep up with the concept? Absolutely. So it's a team effort for everything that we do, but the lead kind of person behind the curation of all of the material that you see in the exhibit itself and the themes that were identified and uh, really kind of how, what was organized and became the exhibit uh, was a student volunteer of ours named Kellen Toombs. Um, so she actually spent about a year uh, you know, sort of learning about what it, how to create an exhibit, exploring our collections, uh, identifying all these diverse themes, uh, brainstorming with our team to put everything together, um, and is now off doing her master's in museum studies. So. Well, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.